Hello, hello, and welcome to your first episode of Collections q and I'm Timothy Kenny, your Bird from Home correspondent, and today we're going to be digging into how we prepare fossils from the field. But first, I should probably prepare my room for this video, so be right back. This is the best it's looked in a long time. So fossils don't come out of the ground looking very pretty. Usually they kind of just look like big hunks of rock. So today, the Burke Museum's fossil preparation lab manager is gonna teach us how they take those big hunks of rock and turn them into the beautiful fossils you might see in our exhibits. Let's dive in. Well, hi Kelsey, thanks so much for coming to visit us at the Burke From Home online. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. So what is your name and what is your role at the Burke Museum? I'm Kelsey Abrams, and I'm the Fossil Preparation Lab Manager at the Birch Museum. So I think a lot of the people watching this video will have seen the Fossil Prep Lab at the new Burke Museum. What exactly is fossil preparation, and why does it happen in the lab? Um, fossil preparation is the process of removing rock from a fossil and consolidating it, making sure it's strong enough to uh, be handled by researchers or looked at by the public. Um, so putting it back together, adding adhesives to strengthen it, um, so providing housing, so cradles or jackets to support its weight, because a lot of fossils can't support their own weight, um, and then making sure it's in a good stable condition for researchers or for going on display. And the reason we don't remove rock from fossils in the field is because in the field you have, when you're at a dig site, there are steel tooled boots everywhere, and a lot of people walking around and not necessarily paying attention. You have cows, they'll come walking, Cross your dig site and cows have been known to destroy dig sites before. Um, you've got all the different weather, hail, a lot of times you get big hailstorms in the summer. Um, you've got the winter weather, the freeze thaw cycle with the snow and the ice. So removing the rock in the field is going to be dangerous to the fossil a lot of times because you're, you're removing that protection from the environment. Um, so what we like to do is keep as much rock on the fossil as possible before we can get it into the lab. The lab is a safe, stable environment where we can carefully and slowly remove rock um, at a pace that's safe for the fossil and then um, in a way that we're able to monitor the impact of what we're doing to the fossil as well. And, and I've noticed uh, that there's a very specific way that you guys transfer fossils from the field to the fossil prep lab in the museum. And uh, th those are called field jackets. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how field jackets are applied in the field and why they're so important in transporting fossils? So a field jacket is kind of like if you break your arm, the bones inside are loose, they need support, they need uh, stability. And so when you get a plaster cast on your arm, it's holding the bones in place so that they don't get rattled apart or injured. Um, a field jacket kind of operates in the same way made out of plaster, it encompasses the bone or the fossil that we're after, and it keeps it together, it keeps it um, safe from vibrating apart as we transport it on a flatbed truck from Montana to Washington. Uh, it keeps bugs and rain and debris out from, uh, away from the fossil. So it's just a nice protective layer that keeps everything held together nice and tight and secure. So we're able to transport it, you know, thousands of miles in a car. Do you have a pretty good idea of what condition a fossil is in before you open up the field jacket? Or is it kind of like once you start cutting into it, you're like, oh, we've got a really, really good solid fossil in our hands, or oh, this one's going to be a little bit crumbly, maybe a little bit tougher to deal with? Um, and sometimes it's a surprise and sometimes I know. So if it's a priority specimen, usually I'm giving pictures from the field, I'm giving all the field notes, I get to see what it looked like when the researchers found it out in the field, how they collected it, all the pictures and data. Other times I'm wandering looking for something to do and I see an easy jacket and I grab it and I might not know what's in it and I open it and it'll be a complete surprise. And I've had everything from chunks of mammoth skull from loose dirt found in Washington. And then I've also opened up things and been like, oh, that is a theropod, a two-legged meat-eating dinosaur, Tobo. Um, so it's sometimes it's a surprise because I'll just grab stuff and oh, it's in here. And then other times I'll, I'll know I'll have all the minutes. So it's kind of all over the place. So what what kind of things are you looking for when you first open up a field jacket? Do you have a pretty good idea of 
kind of how the specimen is kind of placed within the matrix and the rock that you're going to remove or you kind of have to do a little bit of digging before you for you know kind of the ins and outs of where that fossil sits that's a really good question and it's a little complicated so when we're opening up a jacket and we're starting the process of preparation there's a rule called follow the bone so if you have just a tiny piece of a bone exposed in a jacket that's a starting point for you to start working if i just start digging wildly anywhere in the rock. I don't know what's underneath the rock um, and I could hit the bone and I could damage it. Um, that's not what I want to do. But if I have a little bit of the bone exposed, usually it's the part that might have been seen by the researcher in the field, then I can start there and from that point move outwards and expose the bone and remove the rock and work along. That way I don't damage the fossil. Um, that being said, while I might have a little bit of bone exposed and I have an idea of where it's going into the rock, um, things happen to fossils over time. They might be broken. There could be other objects in the rock that I can't see. Um, fossils can distort their shape from time during the fossilization process. So what I might think might be a straight bone could curve drastically because it's been distorted. Um, so I don't know what's gonna happen inside the rock, but that's part of the reason we use microscopes and we do this in the lab. We go really, really slowly uh, to account for not knowing what's in the rock. But generally we wanna follow the bone and have some idea of what the bone is. So if I know I have a vertebrae, then I know that there are different parts of the bone that I should start to expect, and anticipate finding in the rock. Again, it doesn't always happen. It could be just a chunk. And I might not have all the pieces. What are the kind of tools you use to clean fossils and are some kind of more for fine detail and then others are more for kind of just really scraping big things of, of rock off? Mm -hmm. So it depends on the, the scope of the project. How big is the fossil? Uh, how much rock is there to remove? My general rule of thumb is I start with whatever tool is the weakest and is just starting to remove rock, and that is where I stop. And I choose the weakest techniques or the gentlest techniques because what I'm doing is removing rock. Anything I use to remove a rock is going to damage the fossil. Um, so that's why I want to choose and select the gentlest techniques when I'm removing the rock and maybe not go for what is the fastest technique, like one of our big pneumatic tools. So back to FERC, um, if we have bigger projects, we have air-driven power tools called pneumatic tools or air stripes. Um, they, they look like big pens, they sound like giant mosquitoes or bees, and they have a vibrating needle. And those are pretty powerful tools and they're really great for moving rock. Um, for what I'm doing here, a lot of the specimens that I work on at the FERC are much smaller specimens. Uh, <laughs> so this is a specimen you can see it's pretty much all rock it looks like a blob there's not much for you to see there right now um, because this is so small and there's not a lot of rock I don't need a big heavy power tool for this specimen so I'll opt more often for needles um, I have a variety of needles they're carbide steel needles I have different thicknesses um, different edges that I've uh, sharpened my needles into cone tips chisel tips depending on what I'm doing um, and I use these needles inside a pin vise that's what this little piece is it's just something to hold the needle because you imagine pinching a needle all day like that's gonna really hurt your wrist so this just makes it more like a pen so it's a lot more comfortable to use so I use needles and I use my microscope and then I use a variety of brushes um, I have long brushes with long fibers and then I have ones where I've cut the tips off so they're more of a scrubby abrasive um, surface when I get really close to my fossil, so when I remove the majority of the matrix, and I'm left with pretty much just a tiny little fossil and a little bit of mineral and some crust on the surface, a lot of times I'll switch to toothpicks. Because again, I'm picking the most gentle technique to use on these specimens, and toothpicks will do the job. Um, I'm never picking tools that are gonna go fast. Fast is not in my vocabulary. Uh, the purpose is not to get my fossils done the quickest, it's to get them done with no damage done to them. Um, so toothpicks are really great. Uh, I'll go all the way down to porcupine quills or cat whiskers um, because I am working under high magnification and a cat whisker can be really good for getting just into tiny little holes or tiny little ridges. Um, what else do I have here? I have some um, fiberglass paper and then this is called uh, Japanese rice paper. Um, it's archival quality, meaning it's never going to go bad, it's never going to turn yellow, it's never going to degrade. And I can use this to strengthen fossils when I'm gluing them together. Um, tweezers. I have a poofer. This is called poofer. Um, this just helps blow the dust off my fossils when I'm working to keep them clean so I know where I'm working. Um, and that's about all I'm using here.
Yeah, we we uh, we shared a video recently of them cleaning uh, the matrix off of the T Rex teeth, and that that's probably the best case scenario where they're like just barely touching it, and it's all just kind of falling off. <laughs> I was like Jurassic Park. It's not fair how easy those teeth cleaned up. Oh. <laughs> I know, right? That's that's like it, like fossil prep at its at its easiest and best. <laughs> yes. Probably a little bit more tough. Yeah, this is a little more tedious. Um, a little slow going. How long does a typical fossil usually take, if there is a typical fossil? How long it takes to repair something can depend on a variety of factors. For one, it's what condition is the fossil in. Um, so. Is it a sturdy fossil like a Triceratops burl where it's thick, it's robust, um, it's really easy to recognize? Or is it something small that's the same color as the rock? So for example, this fossil, it's a white fossil in a kind of whitish clay. So it's kind of hard to identify what I'm working on. Um, how hard is the rock that the fossil's in? So harder rock is gonna take a lot longer to remove than soft rock. Um, so for example, in that in the video with the T-Rex teeth, that was really, really loose sandstone and you saw how fast they were able to just carefully scrape away that really loose rock. A lot of times that's not the case and it's a really hard rock and we have to use our pneumatic tools. Um, so like a good example, um, the T-Rex skull, that was huge and it had a variety of rocks on it. It had a very, very hard, hard sandstone that was basically like concrete that was very slow going through. And then it had the really soft sandstone that you could just brush away like Jurassic Park. Um, but it was huge. It's a huge dinosaur skull, so that's going to take a lot of time because you have to take the time to manipulate it, to move it, to make sure it's supported. Um, so the T-Rex took over two years to prep, just the skull. Um, I've had specimens that are, you know, the size of a walnut that have taken me 100 hours to prepare. Um, and then I had other ones that, you know, they don't take me that long at all. So a good example would be, um, I have this very, very tiny fossil right here in my hand. He's very tiny. <laughs> um, that took me 16 hours to prepare. Um, so small things that are in good condition can go pretty fast, but it really depends on how hard is the rock and then how, what is the quality of the fossil? Is it broken, is it shattered, or is it sturdy and, and really well uh, fossilized? If it's well fossilized and if it's in really soft rock, you can go through it fairly quickly. Uh, but if it's a giant T-Rex skull, it can take a few years. So, so once you've kind of gone through that part, you, you said that sometimes fossils can be in, in pieces. Um, mm -hmm. What does that process of kind of piecing those back together look like? Is it kind of just like a jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together with no instructions? Basically, it's a 3D puzzle with no picture on the box. You don't have all the pieces and you could have some pieces that don't fit. So puzzling a fossil, uh, some people love it. Like I think it's the best and other people just it blows their mind, it's too tedious. Um, the way that I puzzle my fossils is you get used to each fossil. You become familiar with every little tiny fragment that you're working with. You're looking at texture, you're looking at the edges, um, you're looking at the thickness of the fossil and how that changes across the piece. And after a while, you basically started to remember and kind of like facial recognition, you, you recognize every little fossil chunk. So if I know that I'm missing a piece of my fossil, I might be able to look at that and think, oh, I saw a piece that's roughly that thickness and that color. Where did I find that piece at? And then you're able to put it back together. Um, it's, it takes a time. I do it systematically. Um, again, I get familiar with all the pieces. And usually what I'll do is I'll lay out my pieces, especially if I have something that came to me in 100 pieces in a bag. What I'll do is I'll lay it out in a grid and I'll systematically check each piece against every other piece. That way I keep myself organized. Um, and it's a little more efficient that way, but really it's just getting familiar with, with what are you putting together? So what shape should you be trying to put back together? And then getting familiar with all the pieces that you're putting back together. Is it pretty satisfying when you finally get that one piece to like fit with all the others? Yes. Yes. It's the best feeling. You're just like, oh. And everything just kind of comes together. <laughs> are there any kind of final uh, preparation steps you need before that fossil is ready for the collections or to even go out on exhibit? Mm -hmm. So um, the last thing that I usually do for a fossil is provide housing. So that is the, the cradle that will protect it. So a field jacket is usually burlap or quilt batting and plaster. It's got bugs, it's got dirt, it's got rock, sharpie, it's got all sorts of nasty stuff on it. We don't really want to have that in our collections. Um, so what I'll do is I'll give it a nice cradle, a, which is just like a field jacket, but it's performed in the lab. Um, usually I'll use plaster, uh, 
Same thing I use in the field, but a lot of times I'll also use fiberglass instead of quilt batting or burlap. Um, fiberglass gives your fossil a lot more structure and stability, and also that stuff never goes bad. Um, so I'll make a nice cradle to support the weight of the fossil. It stops it from rolling around in drawers. It helps provide protection from gravity. It allows you to handle and move the specimen safely because um, you never want to move a fossil just with your hands. You want to have something underneath it to support it. So usually the last thing I do is give it some sort of bed or cradle to lay on in the collections um, and then finish the paperwork for it. So I imagine there's going to be a lot of people who watch this video who kind of see what you do and what the volunteers do in the prep lab and say like, I want to do that. That sounds mm -hmm. amazing. Um, what kind of advice would you give to people who might want to get into fossil prep one day? So fossil preparation is a skills based uh, job. It's not necessarily an education based job. Um, if you do want to take classes or learn more about um, topics that would help you become a good preparator, looking at anything with geology, paleontology, biology, um, those are all really helpful topics to start exploring and learning about. In terms of actual skills, um, fossil preparation really lends itself towards artistic fields. So people with carpentry skills um, or painting, molding and casting, um, sculpting, a lot of the more artistic, slow, tedious, um, detail-oriented like arts lend themselves really well to preparation because it's slow, it's tedious, it's creative. You're trying to think of special ways to clean something up together, or you're looking at objects in 3D and putting it back together. So artistic skills are really good to explore and to start playing with if you want to do fossil preparation. Learning about geology um, and paleontology and anatomy especially, learning what our bones supposed to look like. So microscope skills, um, some science skills, with, um, and then a lot of artistic skills or exploring artistic um, hobbies can really help you in the field of preparation. That's great. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of different disciplines that kind of lend themselves well towards doing fossil prep, not just kind of hard uh, paleontology, but you need a lot of different skills to kind of really take a fossil from something that came from the field covered in rock and, and crud to something mm -hmm. that, that you might see in our exhibits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, Kelsey. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing the, the fossils whenever they're done. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. This is so much fun. <laughs>